These are two dimensional materials, but they all have a third dimension. The reason why we call them 2D is not obvious. The material doesn't even need to be thin to be classified as two dimensional. Let's discuss what makes something two dimensional. Late one Friday evening, two scientists, Andre Geim and Koyesta Novelesco, decided to do a little experiment in the lab. They often held Friday night experiments to test ideas unrelated to their normal research. On this evening, they tried a simple experiment that would change the course of science altogether and would even earn both of them a Physics Nobel Prize. They took a chunk of graphite, which is what pencils are made from, and stuck a piece of tape to it. When they peeled the tape off, they saw that there was chunks of graphite on it, and they noticed that some of the chunks were thinner than others. So they stuck another piece of tape to the first one and peeled it off again. Repeating this process, they were able to produce a single atomic layer of carbon called graphene. This is not possible with any material. Try and do this with diamond and you will get nothing. The bonds that hold the atoms together are just too strong for sticky tape to remove. However, there exist certain types of materials that are strongly bonded within layers, but weakly bonded between the layers. Rather than strong covalent or ionic bonds, these layers are connected via the van der Waals force, named after the Dutch physicist Johannes van der Waals, who theorized this interaction. Graphene is an example of one of these van der Waals materials, but it is not the only one. But there is a problem here. Clearly, all of these materials are 3D. So why do scientists call them 2D? For materials like graphene, as they only have one atomic layer, we can rationalize away the third dimension. But for other 2D materials, they are three, four, or even five atoms thick. How can this be 2D? It comes down to the freedom of electrons. All of our electronics uses a combination of conductors, semiconductors, and insulators. Our understanding of these different materials is founded on understanding how electrons flow through them which we describe using band theory. In band theory, we describe electronic systems as having a valence band that holds low energy electrons and a conduction band that holds high energy ones. But let's think of these as roads for the moment. Normally all of the electron cars are stuck in the valence band. In a conductor, multiple lanes are free to move into so the electron cars can move around. Unlike a normal road, the direction of travel is dictated by the electric field that is applied to it, which would be chaos on normal roads, but electrons don't seem to mind. In an insulator, a tree has fallen across the road, and now there is a massive traffic jam. To be able to move again, the electron cars would need to change to another road, the conduction band. But there is a problem. An insulator is like a highway with a large gap between the lanes. The electron cars can't cross the gap to get to the other side. Thus, they are stuck there, unable to move, and no one is coming to remove the tree. Semiconductors, on the other hand, are a little different. They have a gap between the two roads, but it is small. When an electric field is applied to them that is large enough, a U-turn channel between the roads forms, and electron cars can change into the conduction band and start moving again. To understand electronics, we need to model the structure of these bands for each material. And one of the most important parameters is how many degrees of freedom electrons have. Where well, this is a measure of the number of unique ways that something can move and rotate through space. If you imagine a dot or an electron that is stuck on a line, then it can move left or right, but nowhere else. This has one degree of freedom and is a 1D system. In a 2D system, the dot or electron is stuck in the plane. It can move left and right just like the line, but it can also move up and down, giving it two degrees of freedom. For a 3D system, the dot can move in and out of the screen, giving it three degrees of freedom. There is fundamentally a difference in the band structure and the electrical performance of materials when electrons are confined to fewer dimensions. Therefore, we often define dimension of a material based on the degrees of freedom that the electrons have. This leads to 2D materials that clearly have a third spatial dimension, 1D materials that are tubes and can be quite large, and there are even zero dimensional objects, which are called quantum dots. This explains how something can be a 2D material, 
but it does not explain why we care. The reason comes down to solving several unsurmountable issues in silicon-based electronics. Our computer industry is facing multiple roadblocks. We have miniaturized our electronics so far that we are reaching hard limits on the size of our transistors. Transistors are now smaller than 10 nanometers. Some transistors have even pushed that down to four nanometers. This is already touching the quantum regime and we can only make transistors so small. We are simply running out of space to improve. This is one of the reasons that people are so excited about two-dimensional materials because they offer a chance to not only reduce the size of our transistors even further, but more importantly, they can reduce another significant roadblock, heat. It may not seem obvious, but heat is one of the largest roadblocks we face in making better processes. The race for the best computer processor unit or CPU has been an intense one over the decades, with multiple companies having the best performing CPU at different times. There are two main ways to improve a CPU. Increase the number of transistors, which is achieved by making them smaller, and increase the clock speed, which is the number of calculation cycles that are performed every second, which is quoted in gigahertz. Importantly, it is clock speed that is proving most difficult to improve. The first gigahertz processor was produced by AMD in 1999. And by 2005, we had processors that broke three gigahertz. Fast forward to 2024, and you will find that most computers have a clock between three and four gigahertz. Why did we stop progressing? The answer is heat. Back in the late 2000s, I remember attaching a big cooler to my CPU and overclocking it to five gigahertz. I didn't leave it there for long. The processor was not stable, but I could easily get to four gigahertz and get a better performance for playing games. I could do this because my cooler was better than the standard one, which meant I could increase the clock speed and deal with the extra heat. You can't trick thermodynamics. Electronics produce heat that needs to be removed. The perfect example is an old light bulb. The filament glows because the metal is heating up so much that it radiates as all hot things do. But this isn't something unique to light bulbs. Current moving through any wire produces heat. This is called dual heating and states that the power lost to thermal energy in a circuit is related to the current in the circuit multiplied by the voltage drop, which can also be written as the current squared multiplied by resistance. So any current in a circuit will produce heat. There's one exception in superconducting materials, but computers are not made from superconductors. So we can ignore this for now. 2D materials offer a few different pathways to improving the heat problem. But broadly speaking, they can have a lower resistance and thus produce less heat. There is at least one last aspect that makes two-dimensional materials a potential game changer, and that is exotic matter. To produce an exotic state of matter requires either extreme environments or synthesizing materials that are not found in nature. In the case of superconductivity, either the material needs to be extremely cold, a few degrees above absolute zero, or it needs to be not quite as cold, it's still well below room temperature, and a funky material. These are called high temperature superconductors. The hope of finding a room temperature superconductor is held in finding the right combination of atoms in a material to make this happen. But this is hard to do, and there's so many ways that it can go wrong. In contrast, 2D materials are intrinsically easy to modify. For example, we can add and remove atoms, engineer interactions between layers, and even twist and pull them into highly strained conditions. Scientists hope that this testbed of tweakable parameters might lead to revolutionary things like room temperature superconductors. As a consequence, many scientists believe that the future of most of our electronics is a 2D one, but there's a massive roadblock stopping this. Making modern electronics is complicated. The silicon manufacturing industry has spent decades perfecting their procedures, which has allowed them to mass produce large wafers of processors for our phones and computers. On the other hand, 2D materials are relatively new and extremely difficult to handle. The standard exfoliation process is not compatible with large scale manufacturing as a single transistor can be painful to make. 
Have you ever dropped a small piece of eggshell into a frying pan? You spend all of this effort delicately trying to remove it only to watch it slip straight back into the pan again and again, as if the eggshell is taunting you and willfully avoiding you. This is similar to working with 2D materials. Instead of eggshells, it's a few layers of a material. And instead of each attempt to remove it taking a second, each attempt to make a single layer of a device can take hours. To make a full device, scientists can spend weeks in the lab, slowly and methodically placing layers of 2D materials to get their devices. The worst thing is that after weeks in the clean room, which is not the most pleasant place to hang out, you come out, connect your device, and find out it doesn't work. You might have no idea why and just have to start again from scratch. Making one transistor in this fashion can take several weeks, which is a far cry from the billions of transistors that can be made in silicon chips. Fabrication of tuning materials will get better. Large scale wafers of materials like graphene can already be done. We just have to level up the processes for other necessary materials. Once we have achieved this, we will finally have 2D electronics in the palm of our hand. 2D materials are so fascinating, but they are still mysterious to us. Recently, researchers discovered a brand new type of magnet in 2D materials, but you'll have to watch this video to find out more. And there are some references in the description.